Hi ladies, and welcome to this interview with Leanne Lammy. She is going to be talking to you about her career in engineering. Uh, she is at the company, owner actually, of the company of Bocce Engineering. So Leanne, thank you so much for taking the time today to, to talk with us about your career. If you could take a minute to just introduce yourself and tell the girls a little bit about what it is that you do. Absolutely. Well, Christina, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very grateful to be here and have the opportunity to connect with you and all the nerdy girls out there. So thank you so much. So I am Leanne Lammy, and I am founder and CEO of a company called Bocce Engineering, and we develop solutions that pay for themselves. Uh, I started my career as an engineer, and I knew I wanted to be an engineer when I was in the eighth grade. Not very typical. <laughs> I went through mechanical engineering, first tried chemical, and then ended up in mechanical. That was a good fit for me, and, uh, and my career bounced around a lot. Um, and after several opportunities, I got relocated to Houston, Texas, which is where I live now. And I was working for a company you all might have heard of called Enron. And when Enron died, my new business started. And it was then when I felt like my professional career as an entrepreneur, business owner, and engineer all came together. Uh, so that's where we are today. It's been many years as a business owner and an engineer. Well, that's awesome and that's that's interesting to hear first of all that you even knew in eighth grade that you wanted to be an engineer um, I don't know many of my friends who who thought of, of that as being a career or even probably even knew that being an engineer really existed so how did you was what happened with me as well so uh, I used to rake leaves to make money and uh, the neighbors up the street, uh, when it was really cold in Pittsburgh, would bring me in for some hot chocolate when I was out working, and uh, and the husband was an engineer, and I remember looking at his dining room table, and he had all these drawings laid out all over the table, and I was really curious, and I'd walk up, and I'd ask about this, and I'd ask about that, and, and he got really turned on because I had all kinds of questions for him, and so he would start talking to me, and when I realized that's what an engineer was, that they also drove trains, but it was a very different type of engineer. I decided that's what I wanted to be. Well, that's cool. So, I mean, and it's, it's, I think it's really interesting that, I mean, had it not been for them inviting you in to, for hot cocoa, yes. um, you never would have, you know, you never would have found out about engineering and, and wanting to do that. So that's really a very cool story. I like that. Thank you for sharing that with us. Well, sure. Um, so then what does it take because I know that I know that there's I'm learning about all the different kinds of engineers that are out there. There's chemical engineers, audio engineers, mechanical engineers. So what does it take to become and maybe even getting a little bit into exactly what it is that a mechanical engineer does of okay. all the different kinds? Well, I I would say that the the number one thing that I think it takes to be an engineer is you need to be inquisitive and you need to be willing to do things by trial and error, right? that each solution has a different uh, path and that you're probably not going to get it right the first time. And as long as you're willing to go through the motions and practice, then eventually you get the right, the right answer. Right. Um, and uh, for me, I started out in chemical engineering and it was something that you couldn't touch. Really. You couldn't feel it. It was much like electrical, you know, uh, things that you, that you learned about were much smaller than the, that, you, that were tangible. And I felt like I really liked things that were physical, three-dimensional, and the more I got into mechanical, the more it fit me. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so within your career, because um, you've had, like you said, you popped around a little bit too, so even like not just with we'll get to like being the business owner first, but like prior to that, like what, what, what do you think was maybe the biggest thing that you struggled with and how did you handle that? Um, well, I had a few struggles in college as well, right? Um, uh, I, I had to pay my way through school. So I was always working and I got to tell you, I didn't get the best grades, but I did get through. Um, and I did something in college called co-oping. Uh, cooperative education programs and that allowed me to work while I was in school it took me a little longer to graduate uh, almost five and a half years and um, uh, what that did allow me to do was try other jobs and sort of by process of elimination figure out 
what I didn't like so that I could get into what I did like, right? And I think that that continued on in my career. Um, there were a lot of jobs that I tried for a while that either didn't fit me or weren't, um, you know, weren't in an area where I like to live. I, I moved all over the country many times. Um, and, uh, and so I, I moved around and changed a good bit. Um, but I landed into something that very early on, I would say in the, in the 90s, that fit me really well. And it was about energy efficiency. And today, the term they call it is sustainability. And it, I've always been an outdoor enthusiast. I've always loved nature um, and the idea of saving the earth and doing things that are uh, environmentally friendly was something that was a, a big fit for me. So I got into doing energy efficiency projects. And with that, uh, my career really sort of took off because both my passion and what impact I could have in the work that I was doing came together. And when that happened, things sort of just rolled. Well, yeah, and I really like the fact that you um, talked about trying different jobs and really exploring that. Um, that a lot of times I think, ladies, that you, you believe that you've got to have it figured out right now and you don't, <laughs> you know? And to, to, it's okay to, to try different jobs and different career kind of paths to see what's going to fit your interests and your passion. You spend an awful lot of time at the job that you're, that you have. So it needs to be one that actually blends your skills and your design, you know, your passions and, and everything together. So that's really, I'm glad that you brought that out. That's what you yeah. do. That's good advice. I would also tell the, the ladies that, you know, changing jobs every six months is not going to look good to an employer. Oh. Right. And so when I say I changed a lot, it was more like every three to five years. Yeah. And I would also make changes within the company I was working. So if the position I was in wasn't a fit, I would uh, talk to my supervisor. I would talk to my peers about what else is available and, and, and get involved on a project to try other things. So those changes internally, if you can find a mentor or a coach, allow you to grow as well. That's a really good point because, yeah, that knows that. Show, switching jobs and switching companies every six months does not look good at all. No, it would not look good. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so uh, I want to go back, like with being a business owner, because um, I know um, nowadays it, it seems like it's a glamorous thing, you know, to own your own business and to be an entrepreneur and that kind of thing, um, which is great and amazing, but also um, wanting to bring to the girls a little bit about. Um, the reality of it. So with being, with running your own business, what's one of the things that you've struggled with and how are you handling that? Yeah. So the number one thing I've ever struggled with every month of every year, the business has been in operation is cash flow. Yeah. And basically cash flow is a concept where you've done the work, you've built for the work, you're supposed to be paid. You've already spent the money to get that work produced. You've paid payroll to your employees, but the money hasn't come in yet. And how do you manage the time lag between when you've expended the cost to produce versus when you actually get paid? That's what cash flow is. And that's the biggest challenge I've ever had in business, always. The yeah. second biggest challenge I've had is employees. I will tell you that the employees make a company every single day. Good employees are phenomenal. Bad employees will wreck a company. And so, you know, attitude is the hardest thing to hire around but attitude uh, is what develops uh, a cohesive culture. And it's the second hardest thing about owning the company or the employees. I couldn't agree more. And I'm really glad that you brought that up too, because that, that's one of the things too, ladies, that you need to think about when you're, when you're going out and you are interviewing that that's one of the things that was taught to me when I was first looking for a job and was interviewing that it was my attitude um, that would carry me farther then a lot of times the skills, like they're, they're like a lot of times the, the skill things can be trained. I mean, don't get me wrong. You do need to have like coming in with skills, but there are certain trainings and things like that that can be taught or attitude really cannot be taught. You know, you really, that's something that employers are really looking for um, when doing the hiring. So consider that, um, you know, when you're, when you're out there that you're going to be a good fit for the company before you're applying for it too. You know what I mean? Well, it's the same thing around things that are trainable skills versus initiative. People have initiative. 
Mm -hmm. You can learn how to, how to grow your own initiative. Most of that comes from finding your passion and involving your passion in what you do. Um, but initiative is not trainable. You have to bring it to yourself and bring it to your employer. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we've talked about a little bit about the thing um, that you struggled with. What is maybe the funnest or most rewarding part of your career? Well, um, you know, as the business owner, as I've aged, I get to do less of the engineering than I did when I was younger. Um, and I really enjoy the engineering piece of it. I always have. So I get a big kick out of coaching and mentoring some of the younger, uh, less experienced engineers that work for me. Um, and I find that I even get a kick out of doing it for some of our clients, team members, right? That if I happen to be on a project and we're putting a proposal together, together, um, if there's a, a, a junior person on the team that's never written a proposal, that coaching, that mentoring is something I, I have a lot of fun with. Uh, allows me to think about what the process is and how to share that process with them. And, and, and especially if it's a technical calculation or a, a software or something that we're doing on a project, or even if we're in the field, like if I remember one time I had four engineers with me for the first time going into a big chilled water plant and we're walking around this equipment that is massive, right? And uh, there's this noise, this humming sound. And I asked them all to go find the, the, the screw chiller. And they all looked at me and, and some of these guys and gals had master's degrees and five years of experience as engineers but they needed to go find a piece of equipment in that plant that was a screw chiller. And it was fun for them to think it out. And it really, for me, I knew, you know, even if you don't know what a screw chiller looks like, you should know what they sound like yeah. and you'll find one, right? That's the key. And so that kind of stuff for me is a lot of fun when you are able to share your field knowledge and that application so that uh, the, they learn and they grow, right? And it's all about, for me, it all comes back to solving puzzles. I love puzzles. See, and that's what I was going to say. That's what I was thinking of when you were when you were sharing that story. I'm like, well, that's just like she says. It, it's the tangible piece of, and essentially, you're engineering somebody with their knowledge and everything. And I just that to me just sounds like that's right in line with what it is. That she says she likes to do. So that's really very cool. I like it. Yeah, thanks. For the reasons why um, I like uh, doing teaching and things like that too. So mm. that's very cool. How has this been, um, how has this been different? Like when you, cause again, you, in eighth grade, you knew you were going to be an engineer of some kind. And so you're thinking then versus the reality of now, how is it different? Um, so there was a lot of comfort in having a job that gave you a paycheck twice a month, paid all your medical bills, right? A lot of stability, even maybe paid for you to get education or paid for you like me to get my professional engineering license. Um, a lot of stability in that. As I became a business owner, I was responsible for all of that for myself and my employees. Um, so for me, that challenge, that, that puzzle, if you will, of success and, and keeping things going became my new passion, right? Um, and, uh, so that's a big change. It's also a lot of weight, a lot of stress, right? And, uh, uh, someone said, me, said to me one time that, uh, you think when you go into business for yourself that you get to be your own boss, right? And that's, that's a, a falsehood. Uh, what it really turns out to be is every client that you retain becomes your boss. So instead of having one boss, or maybe if you work in a, flat organization, you might have a couple of people that you work or report to um, when you become your own business owner, all of your clients become your boss. So that's a little difficult to manage. The people skills have been something that over the years I've gotten a lot better at. For sure. I was, um, yes. And especially when you have um, clients who have different personalities, Yes, and communication styles, being able to, um, you know, be uh, flexible and be able to, to meet the needs of each one of those bosses um, is something that can keep you on your toes too, I'm sure. <laughs> Absolutely. And so um, another thought that I had when, 
uh, through our conversation is not just like how you thought it would be different, but I imagine that even the field of engineering has changed over over time. So how is it? So I have a two part question. So like, how is it? How have you seen changes in uh, engineering? And then how do you see it changing in the future? Like, do you, what are some predictions that you have for like mechanical engineering going forward? Oh, interesting. Great question. So um, I think the biggest change or shift that I recollect is the use of personal computers. Um, you know, it used to be when I went through college, all mainframes. Uh, and before that, I think that was even, you know, older than me, it was slide rules, right? So um, when personal computers came out, that followed software. And I was going through my professional practice time period before I became a professional engineer. And I got to learn under mentors that taught me how to do everything by hand, right? And then we used the software in order to do something repeatable. Um, sometimes we wrote software so we could make it faster. But understanding how the software works and what goes into a model or a calculation or how the equipment works was really necessary for me. Uh, I liked learning like that, right? It helped me learn. Today, a lot of the, the engineers that work for me never got that hands-on how to do it, what's behind the software. We have a lot of uh, what I would refer to as software jockeys <laughs> where they're used to putting inputs in and they get outputs, but they don't know why. And I would tell you the understanding of why is what makes a, a good engineer a great engineer. Um, and another thing that I guess I would say would, that's a big change is that, um, you know, the world's smaller because we can connect all over the world via the internet. And that wasn't the case before when I was going through college and probably for the first, what, 20 years of my career. So um, that allows us to share knowledge and everything is accelerated phenomenally. Um, and that was much more difficult. Uh, things didn't move quite at the pace that they do today. That's, that is so true. I mean, just like how, how quickly things are, are moving now. It's just sometimes like, just stop. <laughs> but, uh, so I have a question, like, do you think that there's a, uh, are they not doing that as much in college now with mechanical engineering? You were talking about like knowing why things were, how they work the, the old fashioned way or whatever. Like, is that something that um, you would encourage someone who's going into engineering now to really find the way to, to get that knowledge? The more practical experience an engineer can have, whether it's through doing a co-op or a summer, a summer work program, doing internship even as a volunteer and not getting paid, it's phenomenal. The, the coursework to get through engineering school is more and more intense. And the amount of work that has to be done that's theoretical get, has engineers coming out of school without the practical knowledge. It's intended, much like if you're a, a medical doctor, right, you're going to go through undergraduate school, then you're going to go through medical school, and then you have to get your practice in before you can become a licensed doctor, right? Well, for me, I do a lot of design work, and our companies do a lot of design work. So we have to go through a minimum after graduating and having your engineer degree to pass an initial license called an engineering training. That's just all the theoretical stuff. Then you have to have four years of training under another licensed engineer and it, it, minimum of four years to, to have qualified. And then you take a practical exam. And I'll tell you, I took the exam five times before I passed it. It is not an easy exam. And there's some other stories there. I'll tell you, ladies, in, in my day, a mechanical engineer, there weren't very many. I think I was one of less than 20 in a wow. one graduating class of close to 600 engineers that were mechanical, wow. the only woman. And when I went through to get my professional engineering license, there was a lawsuit in the state of Virginia. Um, and women were, were forcibly not being passed. Um, and until that lawsuit got behind us, I didn't get my license. So every time I took the test, it was, I missed it by four points. I missed it by three points. I missed it by two points until finally the lawsuit went through and, oh, surprise, I got the pass. But anyway, um, the practical experience happens. It's intended to happen on the job. 
and you got to jump in. You got to get your hands dirty. You got to want to be out in the field and for mechanical anyway, to learn the equipment, to see the equipment, because that equipment isn't in a college, right? Um, so that was a big part of it. And so, yes, I would say volunteer, 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 get involved, play. You got to play to be able to see the equipment. Sorry, I hit, I hit mute because we've got a train going by. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know if it would come through or whatever, so I was like hitting mute. Um, Leanne, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to talk with us today. I really appreciate it. My ladies, pleasure. Oh, yeah. Um, ladies, be sure to scroll down. Uh, there's going to be a written interview uh, from Leanne. And then below that, remember it's the comment section. If you've got any questions or comments for her, go ahead and leave them there. And then you can um, check back. She will be answering those for you as well. So until then, thanks so much, ladies. Have a great day. Bye. Take care.